The day of surgery, my anxiety level was probably pretty high, but uh, I had a lot of friends and family there, and a uh, pastor, and my support group was great, and I think everybody that came. The first thing that happens, obviously, is the same thing that happens for every patient having surgery with the IV and meeting the different staff members, the anesthesiologists and whatnot. My name is Aaron. I'm Dr. Klappa's physician assistant. How are you doing, Mr. Harder? Good. How are you? And family, how are you all doing? Good. And then, specific to this operation, we have to place the head frame, which is a device that gets affixed to the skull. And that's done through four little pins that get implanted into the skull. The halo, I believe, is the scariest part of the whole operation because you kind of feel it and there are screwing screws in to hold your head in one certain position. But once that's on, they make you really comfortable. That feels good. Once the frame is on, we usually do a uh, CAT scan, which then we are able to use a computer and merge those CAT scan images with the frame on with an MRI that the patient had previously done, which allows us to identify this very small target in their brain, which is what we're trying to basically score a direct hit on with the lead. Once that whole process is done, then they actually get brought to the operating room where we try to make them as comfortable as possible. Their head is held in a way that they can move their arms and legs, they can talk, they can interact with us, but their head doesn't move around. Obviously, we want that pretty still for placement of the leads. Then we use a device that allows us to accurately aim the lead into the brain. And so we line that device up, which looks like a giant protractor, and gives us the entry point into the skull. Then we numb the skin. Are you going to feel a little pinch? This is just a numbing medicine. We usually use some sedation at this point, and we make an incision in the scalp. We put a small hole in the skull about the size of a dime and then place a catheter into the brain, which is basically just a tube that we put a very fine wire through. And with that fine wire, we're able to measure the cellular activity of very small cells in the brain, which helps us know exactly where we are and confirm that the MRI isn't leading us astray. So once we have that information, which is called microelectric recording, we're able to then place the permanent lead into the brain and turn it on, make sure that it's working without really any side effects. And that's why the patient has to be awake. We have to be aware of that. Yeah, you're awake during brain surgery, which was interesting. You'd think you could feel it, but you really can't. And that was the easiest part. You don't even hardly know what's going on back there until they're talking to you and they're trying to make you relax. And you're coherent, just enough to talk to somebody my physician assistant will ask the patient many questions. We're constantly interacting with the patient to make sure they're not having any issues with their speech, with double vision, muscular contractions. That would indicate that the lead is askew, even a millimeter or two. That dialogue, that interaction only takes five to 10 minutes, but it's invaluable in telling us where we are within their brain and what side effects might occur if we leave it in that location. It's exciting and you almost can't wait for them to turn it on and you have to wait a month after surgery for your brain to heal. And then also you have another surgery you have to go through to get the, uh, the generator put in. It takes a little bit of time. You just have to be patient and you have to be patient with the tuning up. I told my nephews, you know, it's just like Frankenstein. Frankenstein didn't get off the table the first time either, you know, so it takes a little while to get tuned up and be able to walk around good again.